Listen, it's good to be here. It's good to see everybody. It's good to begin another academic year. The university's 53rd. I'd like to start this evening, as we frequently do, by extending congratulations to a few of our colleagues for some of their work and accomplishments during late spring and summer. Kyle Morgan on the publication of articles in the British Journal of American Legal Studies and the West Virginia Law Review. Jesse Sargent on the publication of an article in Neuropsychologica. Jared Stewart Ginsburg on the publication of a book chapter in No One Told Me I Would Have to Teach Like That, Guidelines for Special Education Teachers Working with Remote Students. Lance Welty on the publication of a book BJU and Me, Queer Voices from the World's Most Christian University, published by the University of Georgia Press. Glenn Gorley is a recipient of the South Carolina Theaters Association 2022 Lifetime Service Award. Don Larson is a recipient of the Critics' Choice Award at the 2022 Atlanta Fringe Festival for the show Granny's Fix It. Philip Fulmer for appointment as a fellow of the Health Physics Society. Courtney Clayton on the publication of an article in the South Carolina Teachers Education Journal. Ted Couch on election as the president-elect of the South Carolina Sociological Association. Kyla, Kylie Molinari as on appointment as editor for the Southern Anthropological Society Proceedings. Kim McQuiston and Lindsay Simmons on appointment as co-directors of the new Center of Excellence for Teacher Retention and Induction. Polly Hazelton on her appointment joining Matt Nelson as co-directors of the Center of Excellence for College and Career Readiness. And a special thank you to Meredith Love and Matt for the fine job they've done in establishing and developing that center over the past eight years and helping thousands of kids across the PD. Cindy Nixon on election as treasurer of the South Carolina Division of Career Development and Transition. Michelle Norman as a recipient of the 2022 Lewis DiCarlo Award for Outstanding Clinical Achievement from the South Carolina Speech Language Hearing Association. The entire Department of Sociology for hosting a state conference of the South Carolina Sociological Association this past year and planning to do it again this next year. The entire FMU chapter of universities studying slavery for hosting a state conference of other USS chapters this past year and planning to do so again this coming year. The Center of Excellence for Teachers of Children of Poverty for hosting another conference of teachers throughout the state here this year, as they do every single year. And finally, the FMU AAUP chapter for hosting the state conference of other AAUP chapters on our campus this fall. And to the three dozen or so other faculty members who have presented papers at regional, national, and international conferences or sessions in late spring or summer. Let's give them all a round of applause. Now let me take a minute to honor our immediate past chair of the faculty, Glenn Gorley. You know, traditionally, we confer honorary degrees on retiring chairs at commencement. Last spring, we didn't award any honorary degrees because we wanted to keep the ceremony as brief as possible. But this evening, we'll take the time to thank Glenn properly. So, Mr. Chair, will you come forward? And Mr. Provost, would you assist me in this presentation? Glenn, for your service to this faculty and this university, it's my privilege to confer upon you the degree Doctor of Humanities with all rights and privileges 
appertaining thereto. Congratulations, my friend. And Sharon, please accept our welcome as you assume the mantle of faculty leadership and join our senior staff. All of us have enjoyed working with you the past couple of months, and we look forward to the next few years. I have a special guest here this evening that I want to recognize. I don't do this very often, but I want to do it tonight. My wife, Folly's with me. I couldn't and wouldn't want to do this job without her. Folly? Thank you. Just one more recognition and we'll move on. Retirements this past summer opened up an appointment for our next trustee research scholar. This person has compiled a substantial research record and is one of our finest teachers. But beyond all of this, he spent the last decade developing a very special site for faculty and student research, Wild Samako. The newest trustee research scholar is Travis Knowles. Now let's take a few minutes and look at a few of the events that affected the university this past year. We, we were fortunate in withstanding the challenges of COVID fairly well, all three surges. And once again, our infection rate has been the lowest among the public comprehensive and research universities in South Carolina. Despite the COVID surges, we had exceptionally large graduating classes in December and May as we did in the previous year. Let me extend congratulations to our students and to all of you for achieving this. It's, it's a substantial recognition that after all, we're here to get our students through and get them degrees. Meanwhile, at the state level, politics were predictably chaotic. During the first part of the legislative session, bills were proposed dealing with tenure, CRT, ideology, and academic freedom. With the support of most of our sister institutions and our AAUP friends, we were able to diffuse each of these initiatives. I'll resist the temptation to editorialize here. Our AAUP leadership will tell you the most and least supporting institutions. You should know that. Over the same period, politics at the national level have continued to be especially volatile and bitter. How does this affect us? How does this affect FMU? Well, we are all anticipating new regulations from the U.S. Department of Education this fall pertaining to Title IX, the status of DACA students, new student financial aid provisions, and public service student loan forgiveness. Given recent Supreme Court rulings, it's possible that some of these regulations will be challenged legally as soon as they are adopted administratively. And it may be another full year or more before there is much clarification in some of these areas. You know, that's, that's unfortunate. It's unfortunate for all of us but it's more unfortunate for our students. Torn between the initial Obama regs and the Trump regs, Title IX is an absolute quagmire. As for the DACA students, universities have been provided little direction on admissions or financial aid, except for restrictions passed by a number of state legislatures. And loan forgiveness, you know, our alumni and former students have waited over a decade 
for this issue to be revisited and clarified. Beyond these regulations, the Supreme Court is scheduled to hear oral arguments in the Harvard University of North Carolina affirmative action case at the end of October. Most universities are bracing for a decision that will eliminate or amend preferential processes in admissions and financial aid. My concern is the adverse effect that it may have on access and equity programs in South Carolina, most especially need-based scholarships. We've spent a year agreeing upon a new allocation process among the university presidents and the Commission on Higher Education. I would hate to see that work shelved and FMU's annual allocation of $3.5 million in need-based scholarships imperiled. We'll remain attentive to what happens and how it affects us, and we'll get involved as we need to be through that process. All of this may have an ominous feel, but don't let it get you down. We should have a good year here on campus, a year of change and a year of growth. First, let's discuss the construction. Midway through fall semester, work will begin on the School of Business, School of Education building. Thompson Turner is the contractor, and they expect the building to be completed by the spring of 2024. The building will be stunning. The plans are beautiful. I think all of you will be very proud of it. I've always regarded the Lee Nursing Building as the most elegant building on campus. This building will be a fine compliment right across the pond. This December or early January will begin the renovation of the Smith Student Center. The gymnasium and the rear portion of the building will be closed during spring semester and throughout the first part of the summer. If construction goes as planned, we should be back in that building by the fall of 2023. These two projects taken together means that the lower part of campus, the southern part of campus, will have a fair amount of construction underway for the next year to 18 months. During the same period, we'll be paving a few roads and parking lots staggered in a way to minimize as much congestion as possible. Next summer, many of the maintenance projects and other academic buildings across campus will be completed. Later this year, construction will, become, will begin on a new workshop for our engineering programs across campus in the open space right behind the grill. This fall, we'll also choose a contractor and begin drafting plans for the Circle Park building downtown. We'll do this in, consult in consultation with the medical schools at, US, excuse me, at USC and MUSC. Then next spring, our focus will shift back to the main campus as we select a contractor for the Forestry and Environmental Sciences building, which we anticipate will be complete in late 2024 or early 2025. Just be patient with us. There'll be 80 to 90 million dollars worth of construction underway on campus over the next three to four years. In the 2023 budget, we'll ask the legislature for an additional nine million for a major remodeling of Founders Hall. Let's see if we can add one more sizable construction appro appropriation to what we already have in front of us. That would come at a time, if we're successful in getting the appropriation, to begin the work on, on founders about the time that we move business and we move education across campus to their new building. Next issue, the provost. Earlier this year, Peter told me that in the summer of 2023, the gig is up. He's retiring. I personally don't understand this. He seems so young to me. <laughs> Actually, I do understand it, and so do you. 
Peter's had one of the toughest jobs in academe, the provost job, and he's done it very well for the past six years. I don't want him to retire, but I respect his decision. I talked, it out of it. I talked him out of it a couple of years ago, but I think he's not going to be swayed this time around. We, don't, we won't do a testimonial tonight because he owes us another year, but I promise you we'll put on a grand event in his honor in the spring with Australian food and drink. <laughs> so this year we'll need to conduct a search for a new provost. There'll be a nine-person committee. I have asked Keith Beth to chair the committee. He's a department chair. Keith is a former faculty chair and a former associate provost. He'll do a superb job. I'm also asking Sharon O'Kelly as chair of the faculty to serve as vice chair of the committee. Two members will be elected at large from the College of Liberal Arts and one member each from the schools of education, business, and health sciences. I'm also asking Demetra Walker to serve as a representative of the deans and chairs and Charlene Wages to serve as a representative of the senior staff. Of the nine members on this committee, five are from disciplines in the liberal arts, three from professional schools, and one from the library. Six of the nine will be elected by the faculty. I'm asking the committee to begin its work as soon as possible with the goal of bringing three names unranked to me by January 30th so we can hold final interviews on campus and make the choice expeditiously. Now, let's talk about money. This year, the General Assembly was generous in appropriating state funds to all colleges and universities. We received two and a half million in recurring operating money and 18 million to build our new forestry and environmental sciences building. In addition, state employees received a 3% across the board pay increase in July and, re and you will receive an additional $1,500 non-recurring bonus in October. Now, the statute provides that the bonus goes to current employees hired prior to January 1st, 2022, but we've decided at FMU we'll provide it to all full-time employees as of October 16th. Great news for the new faculty. But some of our employees need additional help beyond this. Last year, we provide recurring across the board increases to campus police so we could stay competitive in keeping them and recruiting them. This summer, we're providing an additional 5.5% pay increase on top of the 3% to all permanent custodial and ground employees. This will mean that our custodial employees will now have one of the highest pay scales in the region, and I can't tell you how proud I am of this. Remember, these are the folks who came to work every day to clean and sanitize our workplaces over the last two and a half years. On October 1st, administrative assistants in the academic departments and schools will also receive an additional 5.5% pay increase. They are among the hardest working people on campus, and they richly deserve this additional compensation. In mid-September, the provost and I will work with the deans and chairs for recommendations on faculty pay compression issues to be implemented by the October 31st pay period. We'll put $100,000 into this effort this year and a similar amount next year, assuming next year's budget permits. The Faculty Development Committee currently has a budget of $420,000. It provides grants to faculty up to $27.50 per year and funding for 18 summer stipends at $4,000 each. This year, we are adding an additional $48,000 to this account. 
This will increase the faculty research grant level, Lorna, to $3,000 for faculty and the summer research stipends to $5,000 each. The money that the university puts in faculty research and development is one of the best investments we've made over the last two decades. And this latest increase should help absorb the rising costs of conferences and the rising cost of travel. We will also increase the operating budgets of the instructional departments, schools, the library, and CASA by an additional 5%, again to defer these rising costs. So this fall semester begins with decent enrollments on, on campus and responsible balances in all of our fund accounts. Our education and development foundations have the largest endowments in their history, and this year we have awarded more scholarship funds than at any other time in the past. We are working systematically through pay issues across campus, distributing substantial scholarship dollars, continuing to grow our research and professional development fund, bolstering departmental budgets, and addressing our facilities and deferred maintenance needs. Once again, this should be a good year for us. Now, just a couple of other brief items. You may have seen in the press that we have been designated as a professional doctoral university by the Commission on Higher Education, the first comprehensive university in the state to earn this distinction. This is a new CHE sector designation. And while the reclassification was initiated by the development of our applied doctoral programs, it is a university-wide designation, and it serves to establish a fourth sector within the state's higher education structure. The College of Charleston, Coastal Carolina, will likely seek similar reclassification to this sector within the next year but we were the first. Some of you may need to work with their faculty to try to bring them along. <laughs> this semester, we will begin programs in environmental studies and environmental science. Over the next year, we will likely see proposals from the schools and departments for a new Montessori program, a collateral in autism studies, a psychology doctoral degree, and maybe a new graduate writing program. If approved by the faculty, we'll move these initiatives onto the trustees and onto the Commission on Higher Education for final approval. You know, these are timely programs and they're essential for addressing compelling needs across the state of South Carolina. They also send a clear message to the state's leadership that our curriculum continues to be relevant, and vibrant. The last couple of years has been a challenging time in higher education as we face difficulties that were unimaginable a decade ago. If the chronicle, on higher if the chronicle of higher education is correct, the academy is increasingly divided into two categories. Those institutions moving ahead and those institutions falling behind. I assure you that we are well positioned in that grouping. One of the strengths of this university has long been the close-knit relationship among trustees, the administration, the faculty, and the staff. For those of us who have struggled with various problems, both personal and professional, the friendships at FMU have always been nurturing, therapeutic, and restorative. And I'm deeply appreciative to every one of you for sustaining the sense of collegiality and support and having the innate sense of knowing just when it's needed most. Other presidents occasionally complain to me, if only I had a faculty like yours. Well, they don't, and I do. Thank you. <laughs>